Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Front Matter podcast, I'll be interviewing Gareth Hayes. Based in the UK, Gareth is a security researcher at Port Swigger Web Security and a popular conference speaker and book author. You can follow him on Twitter at Gareth Hayes, that's H-E-Y-E-S, and check out his website at garethhayes.co.uk. And you can also find him on Mastodon at at gaz at infosec.exchange. Gareth is the author of the LeanPub book, JavaScript for Hackers, Learn to Think Like a Hacker. In the book, Gareth shows you how a hacker approaches finding flaws in the browser and JavaScript, sharing with you the thought processes and tools required to find flaws on your own. In this interview, we're going to talk about Gareth's background and career, professional interests, his book, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience as a writer. So thank you very much, Gareth, for being on the Lean Pub Front Matter podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me, Len. It's good to be here. Thanks. Um, I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, so I was yeah. wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and uh, how you found your way into a career as a sort of, you know, web security researcher. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, I grew up in the northwest of England. Um, I started out um, actually from school. I left to do a cyber cafe with my dad, which was really good fun. I learned lots of lots of things doing that. And then um, I started as a web de designer initially, um, all self-taught. So literally from school, I, I just taught myself. Um, and um, I was building websites, enjoying designing stuff. Got I got a real good feel for design, love design interfaces, UI and stuff. And then um, I started to move into programming. I used to love Perl. Uh, Perl was good. Um, you could create all sorts of stuff with Perl and um, parse uh, text files and all sorts. Um, and then from Perl, I moved on to um, PHP. I enjoyed doing uh, PHP. Um, yeah. I, and then when I was designing websites, I thought, hmm, there's loads of flaws and stuff in, in, this, in this site or this code that you've written. It's not quite right. You're not filtering this. You're not doing that. Um, and then I started to get a keen eye for security, web security. And it was sort of my like side project sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I started blogging about um, various web security flaws, um, which I really enjoyed. It really got me interested and uh, excited even. Um, yeah, I was like, at one point... Um, I was on this forum called Slackers. So like Slackers is um, like a, a, an old school sort of security forum for web hackers. At, at the time, it was really popular. It was really, really good. And um, I went on there and I started, I, at first I started looking for flaws in IDS systems. Um, there's a guy, a good friend of mine called uh, Mario Heinrich, who wrote P PHP IDS. And it's like an intrusion detection system for um, finding like uh, malicious code in um, like in your requests to a website, for example, and I, I had real good fun bypassing that. Um, and I, I love the community community feel in Slackers and how we like all got together to 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 learn something or to try and hack something. So, so I really enjoyed that. Um, and yeah, um, when when I found like flaws in um, PHP IDS, it was called at the time. Um, I started to move into other areas. Um, I was always interested in browsers, um, so browsers was like one of the main areas of like, that captured my interest. Really, and it's it's a quite obscure topic to be interested in, like browser security, because it's not there's not a lot of people doing it really. Um, and like I got interested in browser security and one of my first browser bugs was actually a, um, a flaw in uh, Apple Safari um, so yeah um, I found this flaw in Apple so in um, Safari um, and I could read um, different origins and I reported the bug to Apple um, and they initially denied it saying that you couldn't really exploit this and, I, and that drove me crazy. It really did. It's like I had like this urge to f make sure that what they said was correct, and you know, prove to them that it, 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 it there, were, there was actually a browser flaw. So now I'm not recommending this, but I stayed up for 23 hours straight. Now this is not good for your health, but um, I, I did. I stayed up for 23 hours straight trying to 
um, find a flaw in the new version of Safari. And I did, and it was like, I don't know, like winning a gold medal or something in the Olympics. That's the only thing I could possibly compare it to. Um, but once I found that flaw, I, I was just so excited. And I, I talked about it on my blog, reported it to Apple, talked on the Slackers forums about it. And that that particular moment in my career was the point where I thought, I've got to do this as a job. I really have to do this as a job. Yeah, thanks. Very Sorry, much. I was thanks very much for telling that story. That was so great. There's actually a lot to a lot to talk about there, and I, and that's a great moment moment to pause. But um, uh, that's so uh wonderful that description you gave of that 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 urge, you know, that, that you yeah. found something, and then there's your inner. I mean, and I say this as I'm I'm not a hacker, but I think I think I have some sensibilities that are similar. Um, uh, and that just so for example, one time I was working in a job um that involved um using lots of spreadsheets excel spreadsheets basically and uh data um yeah. and um often when when you're working with with other sort of you know um counterparties um uh you don't necessarily want to give them your calculations so you might you might you might show you, what you'll do is you'll often sort of take a spreadsheet and you'll just like sort of copy and paste as values and just give them the values instead of the the model as it were yeah um, the, so the, either the, you the do model. that or you or you give people the model the full model you, you the, the, the professional thing was to do one or the other and then one time from this big company some team they gave my team a spreadsheet and i was like oh it's actually got it's it's showing the, it's actually got the formulas great and that's that's the best thing. Now I can see their thinking and how they went from the original data to their conclusions, as it were. And yeah. there were hidden spreadsheets that were password protected. And it just <laughs> fucking pissed me off. I was just like, this is either copy and paste and just show me the values or like give me the model. But you don't. It was just so it was so D list. You know what I mean? Like and I just yeah. I had this incredible urge to just get it. And so I figured out how to do a V like I found a VBA script and I didn't even know what those, what that meant uh, when I started, but I just like, I, I don't, it didn't take me 23 hours cause it wasn't as complicated as what you <laughs> was breaking Safari, but like I found out how to hack passwords and open hidden spreadsheets in Excel and the, <laughs> nice. the, the rush that I got yes. when I kind yes, of unlocked exactly. that information was just like, it, again, it was probably, it was more like, you know, making it to the provincial team or something like that than winning a gold medal and sort of beating Apple at its game. But, um, but uh, yeah, no, that, that, that excitement and, and, and that rush that you can get from sort of finding something. And then as, as you, as you were explaining in your story, be having to prove it um, and yes. show how, how it can be exploited. But um, before we go into that and that, that sort of, sort of super interesting world of, of hackers and, and that, and hacking yeah. and what your job is now, um, I wanted to go back to that, what you what you said about um, opening the cyber cafe with your, with your yeah. dad. Um, uh, and there, there's two things I'd like to ask about that. One is um, what was the first, do you remember what your first interaction with the computer was? Well, at the time, this was back in 97. Um, I was basically trying to set up a network um, so like this was the first time I ever used a PC. It was pretty late on, really. For I think I was like sixteen or seventeen at the time. So yeah, I was trying to set up a network and set um, a server to um, host like uh, email and stuff like that. And I, I was trying to um, set up a, like IP addresses on different computers and set set all the systems up. And um, yeah, just trying to. To, to do that basically uh, i really enjoyed um creating like the cyber cafe and uh, working with my dad trying to um make money out of it um at the time the internet wasn't actually that big a deal it was quite like uh, it, this was before google so it was like um there was a web crawler and uh, what was the other one called um Lycos, do you remember Lycos? Lycos search engine. It was it was around that time. Um, but yeah, I, I liked um, I liked helping people. They came in. I showed them the internet. I showed them IOC, all sorts of different things. Um, that was really good fun. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, we didn't make a lot of money out of it though, to be honest. Um, we had a we had a lease line, and that was like a sixty four k something like that lease line, which was quite expensive. Um, so yeah, it was difficult to make a lot of money, but I still enjoyed the time. It was really good working with my dad, um, trying to 
build websites as well. That's where I started to learn HTML. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, that's really that's really interesting. So you're a lot of the people that I interview who, who are who are programmers um, and who've had careers in sort of software and stuff. Their first experience is is with programming, but it sounds like yours was with setting things up, um, uh, yeah, so that they worked and 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 helping people sort of learn. And for those those who might not know, a cyber cafe <laughs> was a place that you. <laughs> Before, before wireless and, you know, everybody had, had in, in it with what it, it, it makes you sound old just to say it. And, yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, um, before everyone had an internet connection, sometimes you, what, what you would do is you go to these places called cyber cafes where you could, you could maybe get a coffee or, or, or whatever, but you would sit, what you would do is you would actually pay for time to sit at a desktop computer <laughs> and you would have to yeah. put in a little code they might give you a piece of paper and there was something tracking your time or something like that but then you could you could actually use a computer and and the internet and this was an amazing thing and particularly for example and this this is a really i mean this is just an artifact of of what seems like the ancient past but particularly if you were traveling um cyber yeah. cafes were really important because that's where you could go to check your email and and yeah, just exactly. and, and that that kind of thing or you could, you know, have some some sort of primitive version of a kind of like place where you could store your 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 documents and stuff like that. But uh, that's super interesting. And so um, a lot of what you would have had to do was probably introduce people to the Internet and how it worked. Yeah, 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 exactly. It was like, hey, this is the Internet. This is what you do. This is a search engine. This is how you do, how you search for stuff. It was it was an exciting time. Um, I really enjoyed the personal interaction as well. It was good um introducing people to this new technology and yeah it was very rewarding and i learned a lot um from a personal development point of view like showing people and helping people which was cool this is this is, might be a bit of a cheesy question in the context but did you yeah you must have had to do some security work at the cyber cafe as well right well yeah sort of so the security wasn't great now I'll look back. <laughs> um, so like there was like, I think we had like external IP addresses on every computer and all of this sort of stuff, but I had to work out a way of limiting the amount of time that they spend on the computer and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, that, that sort of stuff. But I, I, at the time I was, I was only learning myself. Um, so I was like a 17 year old kid trying to work out how to, to use these computers computers which was really good fun <laughs> and you started building websites on your own yeah yeah self-taught just googled what's html how do, <laughs> how do you build tags and stuff and how do you use tags um yeah just what learned it myself it was, that, it was that's cool. fascinating so so by 97 you kind of didn't need to go out and buy buy books or get magazines or anything like that in order to uh, learn how to build mm -hmm. websites no, there wasn't any books around that I could have remembered. Um, yeah, so it was more like just Google. Well, not Google. You'd have to like Lycos it or something. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, you'd use Lycos and or uh, was it Alta Vista. Alta Vista is one as well, I think. Um, and yeah, you'd, you'd search for like tutorials, HTML tutorials, and just follow that. Try and learn and, and build stuff. And uh, what was your first job? My first job? Yeah, for another, for another employer. Oh, for another one. Oh, I was a web designer um, for a, a company um, quite close by to where my cyber cafe was. Um, yeah, I started developing uh, websites with them. And um, eventually you sort of, you got, you got into security uh, and uh, you yeah. spent a few years at Microsoft. Uh, was that, was, yeah. was that like, I thought people often like to hear what it's like to work at sort of the big, big name companies. Well, okay, so with Microsoft, um, the, the, what my role was, well, it was quite a different journey than somebody else's role because I was working from home. So I was basically, what I was doing was I was blogging my, um, web security research, um, posting on Slackers. And at the time I was working as a web developer, a PHP developer, and I got made redundant and, um, I posted on the Slackers forum saying, you know, I need a new job and all this. So this has happened. Anybody got any leads or whatever? And um, there was a guy called uh, David Ross from Microsoft who recruited me. And he's, an, he's a really awesome guy. He's actually one of the first people to discover um, or define cross-site scripting, which is pretty cool. Um, and I worked with some pretty awesome researchers at Microsoft. Um, so I, I was basically working from home, logging in um, to like a, a shared system, 
posting research that I've been doing and trying to hack the cross-site scripting filter in IE, um, which was really, really good fun. I, I worked with some pretty awesome guys. Um, there's one person who probably wouldn't want me to name so well, but they were, they were awesome. Um, I, I worked with Manuel Caballero. Um, he was from Argentina. Um, yeah, and I worked with loads of different people uh, from different um, countries. We all got together over the internet, over um, certain, certain software and found, found flaws in browsers. It was really good fun. That's really interesting. And now you work for Port Swigger, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, who they are and, and what you do for them. Sure, yeah. Well, Port Swigger is an absolutely amazing company to work for. Um, I'm, I'm privileged to work for them. Um, so, yeah, what we do is, well, I, I work in the research team, so our, our job is to find flaws in browsers, in uh, online systems, in all sorts of stuff. So research new attack techniques and uh, try and discover new attack techniques. Um, so th this recently what I've been working on is um, server-side prototype pollution, um, which I'm going to give a talk about, um, but that's really fascinating stuff. Um, you can basically... Um, You've got a server that's running on Node, and you can try and exploit that server with prototype pollution by changing the prototypes on that server. And then using those properties, those prototypes, you can then maybe get remote code execution or get another flow um, using, using that. And, and it's been my job to research that particular topic, which I find really good fun. Um, working with Port Swigger, there's so many good people um, that work there. Um, there's, yeah, there's James Kettle, um, who's a well, world-renowned web security researcher, who's actually the head of the research department, and he's just a top guy to work for, really good. Um, yeah, he's, he's an outstanding researcher, um, so I, I feel privileged to be working alongside people like that. I'm really curious to to learn a little bit about um uh, about how the the sort of day to day of a web security researcher kind of job works. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so for example, I mean, you know, when uh, when you're given a sort of a, a, something to research, where does that where does that come from? Is there some some client who's like we're concerned that we've got a weakness in this area, and can you try and find a way of exploiting it? Is that is that the way it works, or how how would how would a no. sort of research job come down so, to you? What you've described is like normally like a pen testing company. Okay. But we, what we do is um, research. So what we generally have is a board of like interesting topics to cover. We pick the topics to cover, like in a meeting or whatever. And what we do is we try and find new techniques based on that uh, that topic, and then we create like three web academy labs that people can try and hack for themselves. So what our job is to do basically is find the new techniques and then apply them into specking a lab. And then um, somebody can then, uh, one of our developers can then de develop the lab. We can test the lab and then report any problems with it, redefine it if we need to redefine it, change it in some way. And then, um, yeah, and then write up so we, we spend a lot of time in Google Docs because we've got to write up a, a blog post about that particular topic. We've got to write learning materials. We've got we've got absolutely amazing copywriters that uh, that fully understand the topic. Um, yeah, so um, it, day to day, it's like you you, you sort of got you you got different time periods. So like you've got. The, the, the first section is discovering this new technique. So you need the technique first. So you just, you, do, you, do, you, do, you do some like discovery, some research on a topic for X amount of time, depending on how interesting or how well it goes. And then after that period, you, you, you write up your findings and then you start to develop um, labs. So you, know, you spec out a lab that describes this technique that helps other people learn it basically. Um, and then once you've, you've done all that, um, you start writing up the, finish off the post, put it in a, in a CMS and then uh, write up your findings, do a talk, do, do your slides. It, it's the, the sort of like different stages that, um, yeah, that day to day that I do. 
it sounds like and and then and so then when you've got this when you've been sort of you've sort of decided in your group like you know who's going to take what what piece of it do you is it really just yeah. you're sort of sitting down there and you're like hacking away like trying to yeah yeah that's yeah, it yeah yeah so like uh for example I, I brought chrome recently um and the the way i broke it was um so normally I'm research, I, did, I was doing like XSS research because we've got like a cheat sheet, for example. Um, the cheat sheet's got loads of like different vectors on and stuff. Um, and whilst developing that cheat sheet and updating it, um, I, I noticed that Chrome was behaving a bit oddly. So like what I was trying to do was um, in, the window name is very interesting because – the window name can pass information from one page to another or different domains. So I was like experimenting with window.name and I noticed Chrome, um, when you modify the URL of a, an iframe, like a an embedded page in, in, a, in a website, when you modify um, an iframe's URL to about blank and then read the from, from a different host and, and try and read the window name, you could actually read it, and that's a security flaw because um, it, it you what what you what you could do then is pass information from one domain to the other and read it. Well, but what was really interesting was when I changed the about blank uh, the URL to about blank, you could read sensitive information from the URL. So that was a security flaw. Um, yeah, and I, I reported that to. To Google, um, I think it had a three thousand pound about uh, three three thousand dollar bounty for it, which was really cool. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's that's, uh, that's really fascinating. I know that I'll, I'll, I'm going to point people to. Um, there's a, a bunch of it because a lot of what you do is sort of writing up things as well. There's a lot of places yeah. I can point people to. Um, but there's um, you you um, you found a way when people started getting onto Mastodon, um, you found a way to sort of get passwords out of. Yeah, that you know. was fun. That was fun. So. Yeah, we was, was on Twitter and um, everybody was like jumping ship and they were like, oh, Mastodon is really good and really great. And he's like, oh, God, I know where this is going. I'm going to have to break it. So I, I was like, <laughs> I was I was messing around with Mastodon uh, trying to break the filter. And I, at, at the time, I was live hacking it sort of thing like I normally do. So like, oh, look, this, this you can actually um, do this and put a t- uh, tweeting it. Well, not tweeting it, but. But, uh, posting it, I think we call it in Mastodon, and people were saying to me, "Hey, do you, hey Gareth, don't you know um, this Mastodon instance supports HTML?" And I was like, "What HTML? You can embed HTML." So then, okay, I've got to try and break this HTML filter. So I, I then I started private posting to my Mastodon account these HTML. Uh, filter bypasses and I noticed I could inject iframes after a while you so what the trick was you could use like an icon so you could embed some HTML and inside the attribute you could embed an icon and then this well it's like a placeholder that changes to an icon so the placeholder gets replaced you can break out of the HTML attribute and then you can you can execute whatever you whatever you like so um, I was working um, on this, and I, I was t- I was talking to James, and he's like, "That's so cool. Uh, why don't you just spoof the interface of Mastodon?" I'm like, "Yeah, that's a good idea." Um, so the the problem with exploiting like a cross site scripting flow in a modern browser in a modern application nowadays is we've got something called CSP. So CSP stands for Content Security Policy. And basically, it's like prevents you from executing scripts that you shouldn't execute or other things, iframes and stuff. But what it doesn't prevent is for you to reuse the interface of uh, the the site. So um, you could what you could do is embed like um, the repost icons and stuff like that. So I can spoof the Mastodon interface and then what would happen? And then I could inject like a hidden uh, input or, you well, use a, use a normal input that f- auto-filled in your password. So like I, I could have tweeted this or posted this publicly and then 
it would automatically fill your password in from Chrome. And then when you click on one of the post buttons, it would it would then send your password to that remote server. Obviously, I didn't do that. I didn't try to exploit people, but I wrote it up and uh, did a video. And yeah, yeah, I was, it was that was really good fun. It was a really good research project. And yeah, that, this is a typical thing from Portsmouth. Like, I found this like on my spare time, but then Portsmouth said, "Well, come on, you can just you, you, you can you can write this up on our blog. You can do do the research." So I, 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 I was researching the, I, I initially found it at home and then um, carried on the research at Portswigger and wrote it up, um, which was really good fun. And that's what it's like to be a hacker at Portswigger. It's really good fun. Yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. And that um, uh, it's, uh, and that it is, that it is just to hear about like the excitement and, and the fun and the fun of it and things like that. Obviously yeah. if, if the people who are, uh, are, to whom these things are reported might not feel the same kind of excitement <laughs> when they find out about it. But, well, um, to be but... fair, they, they were really nice. The, the 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 person that runs the Mastodon glitch fork was really nice, really responsive. Hmm. They fixed the issue within, I, I, th- well, I can't remember the timeline, I mean, it was less than a few days, I think. Um, so they, they were really responsive. They were very smart. They knew exactly how to fix it. And yeah, it was brilliant working with them. So it was a good experience. Actually, that's really interesting. That leads me, I want to, um, just in a minute, I want to ask you a little bit about community and how kind of hacker communities work and have maybe changed over time. Um, but before, yeah. we do that, before we do that, I just wanted to mention, if you're hearing words that you might be unfamiliar with, like spoof and inject and and execute and things like that, there's a book out there called JavaScript for Hackers that you might you might be interested in getting to learn to learn a little oh, bit yeah. more about this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but um but I just I just I did want to say for people for people who sort of aren't programmers and I'm not one but I you know have you know I'm close to a lot of programming work and stuff like that um for people who are listening and maybe maybe just to, to give you a little bit of a kind of like a little sense of the detail here often ways that you try to hack things are to try and get something to run code um to to execute code that you've injected into the site um that yeah. that it's sort of it it the site isn't built it isn't supposed to be able to run code in that place or in that way or something like that so you're trying yeah. to get you're, you're basically trying to get an app to run code that you've written um uh and and this is a, a sort of i guess a sort of very sort of classic way of trying to trying to hack something um and then and then once you once you're and the thing is once you once you once you found even like a little as i gather just from doing a little bit of research for this interview once you can get a little when you've proved something small can be run you're like aha probably something more significant can be can be executed um in the app yeah exactly yeah okay yeah so the the idea is to get your attacker code onto that website um and there's various different techniques that you can do that you can do it with css you can do it with html you can do it with prototype pollution you, you can do it with javascript there's all sorts of ways that you can run your own code on that particular application yeah um and yeah and so to talk a little bit about community um yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not not a part of any kind of hacker community. I'm, I'm actually quite curious about like how that world works because one, if you look at the credits in Gareth's book, for example, anyone who gets it, like there's all kinds of like interesting kind of you know there's some people's real names, and then there's some people's kind of usernames that they go yeah. by, presumably on on these communities, and you might have never seen someone's face or something like that. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about just what what the sort of the hacker communities are like. Do you just show up out of nowhere and sort of just sort of start? replying to people with suggestions or asking questions? I think the best way that I could describe it is you you just try and find some good research and then just you just build from there. So if you if you think somebody is doing some really good stuff, then you, you shout about it. And I, I've got a I've got a, quite a lot of followers because of my research in the past. So I think it's good to help the other researchers highlight some good stuff that they've done and it just builds from there so originally i talked about slackers um and that was like a, a forum and it what's what really happened with when tr- uh, twitter was launched was people moved away from that sort of thing um so they, they moved towards twitter and then after that discord slack that sort of stuff um but i, I really stayed on twitter and enjoyed communicating with other people on Twitter. Um, 
yeah, and I just built, I, I built friends, like just made friends. Um, there's just, there's a, just a fantastic community out there, um, and just sharing research and talking about research over Twitter, over Mastodon, or whatever. Um, you, you can just build. Um, real good friends you can learn lo- learn loads of stuff like when when you you tweet something like oh i found this new cross-site scripting vector and other people will say oh yeah what about this what about this and you just build a collective knowledge and it's really good it's really good fun um it's good to be open in that way um i know a few hackers were they don't really share things they keep quiet they're brilliant researchers they're brilliant hackers and they, they do like, um, you know, a, a black hat talk or whatever, which is really cool, obviously. Um, but it's, I think it's good to share things as well, like share with other researchers, learn from other researchers, let them learn from you and that, that sort of thing. And I, I think Twitter really replaced the Slackers forum. So like forums were a big thing in the early 2000s and late 2000s. Um, but then it moved to Twitter. Um, well, it, first first people were blogging quite a lot. Um, they're like using Google Reader to find other hackers w- that would blog in. And then we moved to Twitter and, and started doing research on Twitter, um, which is really cool and blogging um, blogging stuff as well. Uh, one thing for people who are listening who might not be familiar with the kind of tech world, um, that for them, the word hacker might mean basically criminal. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. you know, someone who's someone who's trying to do bad things. Um, and yeah. I guess, yeah, the talking about community and, and, you know, doing things, you know, I was wondering a little bit about... Uh, I don't know just how how that how that works in the hacker community. I mean, do you, if if you get a sense that someone's looking to is a bad actor, are there ways of kind of well, I don't know what what do you what do you do if you if you get a sense that someone's maybe a bad actor that's asking you questions or prompting you? When I when I think of a hacker, I think of curiosity, not whether they're evil or not. And I think the the media of of, of sort of got on this bandwagon where a hacker is evil and they do bad things. But that's not the case, really. A lot of the people I know are good hackers. They do good research. They share stuff. They report bugs to vendors and get stuff fixed, which is cool. Um, and I, I don't I don't think that um, you, you can get the sense of whether somebody is evil or not over like Twitter or whatever, just by their actions really. If if they're reporting bugs um in the correct manner and not trying to exploit people, then you know that's a good indicator that they're they're a good they're a good person to work with. So um as long as they the, the, as as soon as somebody that like if you saw a red flag like what they were doing, like you shouldn't do that, then obviously you, you wouldn't you wouldn't um, share research with them or uh, communicate with them. But I, I would say the majority of the people on, on Twitter that I follow are people that, that have got good intentions and um, want to learn stuff. And I think hacker is about learning and sharing your research. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean hacking a, a website for evil and making money, that sort of thing. Um, so like, you, you, the, the, there is a, a, a way that a lot of the time it, um, a hacker is portrayed to be evil, good or bad or whatever. The hacker is just really curious. They just want to learn. Um, and, and that's basically it really. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much for that. That, that I mean, I'm, of course I'm completely on board with that sort of, uh, you know, um, really positive representation of a hacker. I mean, you know, just to give people again, to sort of narrow it down to, to a very specific thing, you know, a kind of a, a hack in lean pub, for example, would be, how do I? I want to make a few blank lines. What's the what's a what's a way I can do that? Um, and if they look at our specification and it's like there's oh I don't see any way to make blank lines and they're like ah oh, an empty table row, you know <laughs> I'll, I'll make, yeah, I'll cool. make, I'll make an a... empty table I'll make an empty table, um, so that'll yeah. just create a blank and that's 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 in a hack right you know that's, that's exactly exactly that, that is a good description yeah it, it's using something that you never thought was intended, but will achieve your results. That, that's it. It's like 
Uh, that's a great description of a hack to do something that nobody expected, but gets you the results. Yeah. And, and, and as you as actually, you talk about this in the book, like it's important to have a goal when you, when you, you know, and yeah. sometimes you can find yourself without one and then you can use, you know, various ways to get one. But you, yeah, that, that's one thing I love. And I, I, just going back to the beginning, beginning of the interview, when you talked about, you know, getting the gold medal or whatever, you know, like when you, when you, yeah. that, that you use the word urged, you know, when you, when you that's like when you when you've got that that's the hacker kind of mindset is like okay i'm gonna get to a point where i can achieve my goal um yes and, yes. and it, it doesn't matter if it's shoestring and bubble gum and you know or whatever exactly. i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna find a way and that that is you know it's it's it is i, I guess i'm just like it's it's so interesting to be like in that in that zone like there's like a kind of magnetic kind of pull um, yeah towards yeah towards that goal yeah, it's, it's all about persistence, really. Um, so, like, obviously, you, you've got skill. You, you've got to have skills. You've got to have knowledge. But it, a lot of it is persistence and luck a lot of the time. So you, you, can, you can buy more lottery tickets by, you know, being persistent and, and getting, getting the luck. And your knowledge helps you find things um, that normally – you wouldn't you wouldn't know of so like it's a mixture of like look persistence and skill and knowledge and all those combined helps you find a flow and i think persistence is one of the my biggest attributes because what i what i what i mentioned in the book as well is um you set the goal and you you, you just keep it there. You just can't carry on. You carry on. And then you can find like a sub goal in that goal. So like, for example, I want to ex execute JavaScript without parenthesis. So that, that immediately sets yourself a goal that you can stick to and try and find variations and endless variations of it. And what you what you're doing is you're accumulating knowledge at a very fast pace. So when you've got this goal, you already know what you're going to do. So, like a lot, a lot of the time, as a hacker, you can you can open a blank page and think, "What what can I do here?" But if you set yourself a goal, like, "Okay, I want to execute JavaScript without parentheses," for example, just try try and do different ways of doing that, and and then you start to learn more about the JavaScript language itself. You start to learn about the the techniques to achieve that, and then that leads to other things. So, like. Um, there was a flaw in um, Google Chrome, for example, where you could hijack JSON by using like getters and setters and stuff, and um, that that all happened because I was trying to do a goal, like trying to find this particular uh, thing, and and that branched out into something else. So, yeah, it's really important to set a goal, and persistent like persistence is um, defined as trying to do something over and over and over again. But it's not just that. When I, when I talk about persistence, I mean, yes, you want to keep trying and try variations, but you keep it in the back of your mind and then come back to it like months later. And that, that's persistence, coming back to it months later and trying to to do that. Um, yeah, that, that's what I define. That, that That's what I think a hacker is. A hacker is persistent. A hacker is knowledgeable a hacker will try different things and trying to find things that shouldn't shouldn't work but do um just before we move on to the next part of the interview and talk about a little a few things about your book specifically um yeah. i wanted to ask you a variation of a question that's come up many times on on the podcast which is um yeah if you were starting out now with an intention of having a career in web security yeah. um would you consider doing a sort of full computer science degree at a university or would you yes. okay yes i would and i i haven't had that privilege to do that because i i, have, I haven't grown up from a wealthy background so I, I didn't have the opportunity to go to university and study and get a degree etc cetera, etc cetera. um but i think that is really important because i've seen when when i've been working um, trying to program things and, and trying to learn things. I've, I've noticed that a degree in com computer science would be very useful because you can 
build things in a better way because you've got more knowledge about building things. And I, I think it is it is very important. Um, I just didn't have the opportunity to, to do that. Um, but I, I have no regrets about that. There's nothing that I could have done about it. Um, and I'm, I'm quite pleased that I, I managed to learn stuff um, on my own, basically. Um, but yeah, I, I do I do think that getting a degree is important and you, you can do both. You can, you, you can try and teach yourself, um, question the person that's teaching you. That's really important. I think don't accept things that have been told to you. Um, but de- definitely getting a degree is, for, 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 uh, for, I, I would say, would be important. Um, but, but, yeah, question everything. Don't accept something that's been taught to you. Make them prove it to you. Make them, you know, make them justify what they're teaching you. That sort of thing. And if you do that, you will be a extremely well-rounded hacker. If you can, if you've got a computer science degree and you can learn to think, uh, question things and learn to think like a hacker, then yeah, you, you're going to be pretty damn good. Yeah, thanks very much for that great answer. And in particular, um, that that advice about um, questioning things uh, really resonates with me. I mean, one of the, one of the things that um, I think people can. Um, miss about the opportunity that you have with the wonderful opportunity if you have the, the time and the money to spend you know three or four years in your youth at, at an at higher education institute studying things is that just having access to those professors yeah assuming they're good and they're they're not all good um but if they're if they're good ask them questions show up yeah. at office hours um uh you know because that that the, the, a they'll love it <laughs> uh and they'll and they'll like and be they'll like you but see like they'll you will learn so much more yeah. if you actually ask think about things and take the opportunity to take advantage i mean to put it in kind of like very kind of mechanistic terms take advantage of the resources that are available to you and probably yeah. the best resource available to you in addition to time is those is, is assuming you have it is is those is those professors and uh you know if there's people visiting the campus to give talks about things stuff like that Go to those talks, you know, that's... Definitely, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Because it, 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 it's just like, you you will learn from that. Like they, they, they are extremely knowledgeable people. They will teach you things that you don't know. And if you ask them questions, they'll answer it. So, the, you know, it, you should definitely um, pursue a computer science degree, definitely. Yeah. Um, and and but of course, with that said, uh, you know you're living proof that you don't need to. So, <laughs> well, yes, you don't need to. But I, I, I've got to admit, my journey was has not been easy. It's not been an easy thing, really. But you know, um, if if you've got persistence and you try, you know, you you can you can accomplish your, your goals. And that's all that's all I try to do, really. I just I try and set myself goals. I try and accomplish them. And pe- people sometimes give up after. You know, they, they've set this goal and they, they give up and never come back to it. But I, I'm a very persistent person, and I, I carry on, learn these things, and it's helped me in my career. Um, I've I've learned a tremendous amount. I, I know people from around the world; they're extremely intelligent, extremely smart, and it, yeah, it's just really good fun. And, and although I wouldn't recommend my journey because it, it's not easy, but yeah, it's like. I, I'm happy where I am. So yeah, I, I, I've got there in a way. Uh, I wish I could have been a different way, but you know. <laughs> Speaking of um, persistence and achieving goals, so you've written and yeah. published a book, <laughs> which um, yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it can be can involve a lot of persistence and sometimes sometimes luck and sometimes coming back to things months later. But so the book is JavaScript for Hackers, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about. Um, if you remember what the sort of you know origin story of of the book was, uh, was there a moment when you're like, you know, I really need to kind of collect collect my thoughts and present them to yeah. people? Did someone say, hey, you should write a book, Gareth? So, well, I, I've written a book before. Um, I, I, I wrote it with um, some of the hackers, uh, Mario Hamrick, um, David Lindsay, and Eduardo Vela, um, and I wrote a book on like obfuscation, um, and I've always thought. I don't want to do another one. I, I should do it because I want to share the knowledge that I've accumulated. I want to give people my journey, my like how, how I discover flaws. I, I wanted to document that. And yeah, I, I just thought, why not write a book? And how I actually wrote it was half an hour on 
every day for a few months on my lunch on my lunch hour. Um, so I, I, I didn't really have time at home. I'm, you know, if if I'm working, I'm, I, I get home and I'm tired. I'm going to take my girls to dancing and that sort of thing. So I didn't really have time at home to write a book. But um, on my lunch hour, half an hour every day for a few months, I, did, I, I just wrote one. Um, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed writing it. Um, and I thought Lean Pub was really awesome. Um, like the, the, the way that you, you make writing, writing the book uh, as, as such an easy process and also exporting it into different formats as well. I thought it was really cool. Oh, thanks very much for that. Uh, we always appreciate the kind words and well, the criticism too, but um, uh, that, no, that's really interesting. So a lot of people have um, uh, do, 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 do kind of set schedule things like that, particularly if they have, if they have kids at home and things like that, you know, um, yeah. some, sometimes I actually, um, this was a long time ago, but I interviewed a, a woman who was a, she wasn't a lean pub author. She was a best-selling kind of novelist. And um, when, when her sort of novel writing career started taking off, what she would do is she would, um, she had a, she had a little girl. And so what she would do is she would go out, she would, she had a babysitter and she would go outside and she would wave goodbye to her daughter and say, I'll be back in a few hours. I have to go to work. And she would climb yeah. the window into her office. Um, so she could, so she could get some writing done and that was the way she did it. But having, having, being, having an office and lunch hour is a better way to do it. But for a lot of people, it actually is like that. It's like, you know, I'm going to set aside this amount of time every day at this time yeah. of day, and then I'm just going to go to it. And so did you, did you um have like an outline that you that you were just sort of like so okay today I, this is where i am in the outline and this is what i'm going to write or was it a little bit less formal than that it, it was less structured than that um what i tried to do is right i, I thought to myself i want to write a book that i enjoy writing so i started writing like the the, the first part of the book is what i do to find a flaw and then just moved on from that so like i started um, setting a goal, so um, yeah, I, I, like I, I thought, why don't I base it on what I do? So I set a goal, make that a chapter, fuzz in what I do to find flaws, that sort of thing, and I just it, it, it sort of grew organically, really. So um, I set out, I, I, I set out a, a rough plan, and then just built on it after. And just to give people a little bit of a flavor of the book, um, you just mentioned fuzzing, uh, and you talk about this in the book. So, uh, what's what's fuzzing? Fuzzing, yeah, cool. So fuzzing is absolutely awesome. So, like, imagine you want to ask somebody a question. So you say, okay, how many character? Uh, all right, what characters are allowed after a double quote? You ask somebody that question, and they can give you one reply. But with fuzzing, you can ask them a million different a million different things. You can say, does this character, this character, this character, millions of characters, are these characters allowed after this double quote, after before this double quote? And that's what fuzzing is. Um, and it, it, it's not just that it can answer a million questions, which it can, but you can also make it more intelligent. You can um, make it understand what you're trying to do. Um, but... The essence of it is you, you want to fuzz this particular vector or um, you want to find a browser flaw, for example, and you just and you, you, nowadays, like when I was hacking originally, you could um, you could get like 10,000 answers to the question sort of thing. So like you could say, which 10,000 characters are allowed after this double quote? Now you can ask... Chrome, how many million, what million, like the Unicode space, how many How many of these characters are allowed after that double quote? And that's the difference nowadays. You can answer a million different things at once within seconds. And, yeah. and, that, and that's what fuzzing is. It, 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 it enables your research to answer a lot more questions than you could possibly do on your own. And that's the essence of fuzzing, and that's why it's so important. And there's a whole chapter on fuzzing in my book, and I, I, I detail the approach that I use to find flaws in uh, Firefox, for example. So, like, one of the questions I asked was, okay, browser, what characters after um, exclamation mark are allowed? Like, in a, in a closing comment. And Firefox answered that question and said you can put a new line in there. And it's like, what? That's crazy. And that can break filters. And 
yeah, I reported that to Mozilla. They got it fixed. And that's just one example. So to sum up, uh, fuzzing allows you to answer a question millions of times very fast. And that's what it is. Yeah, thanks very much for that. It's 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 so interesting, and it, it particularly one thing, one sense you uh, get from reading your book is this, you know, how things have changed a little bit over time. And you talk about like you know having to do things in batches back in two thousand and eight or whatever with your laptop, having to do things in batches of ten thousand kind of tests or what or what or whatever. That was exactly it. Batches of ten thousand. Yeah. Yeah, but then being able to do millions at once and um uh, and to see what you know what what breaks um uh is is was just an an incredible tool, um. Uh, there's so many more things we could we could talk about, but I would definitely recommend people sort of check check you out on Twitter and and check out the book and stuff like that. And if you're interested in hacking, go go find a community and and, and be nice uh, and see yeah. how other people behave. But I gather an important feature of that is of getting into it as well is um uh, being being willing to ask questions. Like you were mentioning, you know, if you were uh, you know had access to someone sort of really knowledgeable about knowledgeable about something, be, go ahead and ask questions as long as you ask them sort of yeah. well and thoughtfully and you're, you're you mean well. Uh, go ahead and do that. Um, yeah. I try and ask them a challenging question definitely um the last question um i always like to ask on the uh podcast if the guest is a lean pub author is um if there was one thing when you were writing your book in lean pub that had you sort of shaking your fist going damn you lean pub why don't you fix this or if there was one magical feature we could build for you uh that you would love us to have can you think of anything that you would ask us to do mm, yeah so like I would like some sort of auto completion, like um, when you're writing a paragraph or something. I think in Google Docs it, it suggests you a like a a phrase that you can use that sort of thing. That that I found that quite useful. So I, I use Google Docs quite a lot to um, write the book and then move to the editor, the the in browser editor in Lean Pub. Um, so yeah, like. Spell checking like how Google Doc work, how Google Docs works would be good. Auto completion would be good for when it recognizes like the the phrase that you you're currently writing would be really useful. That sort of thing. Oh, thanks very much. That's a really uh, that's a really straightforward and very great um, suggestion. Um, you know, I'm, I use we use Gmail, and so I'm sort of you know familiar with the sort of yeah Gmail prompting how to yeah. prompting how to end the sentence kind of thing, which can actually be can actually be really useful either both positively and negatively like that's the last thing yeah it can't be negative as well (laughs) (laughs) uh but yeah thanks very much for that uh and gareth uh, thanks very much for being on the podcast and taking some time out of your evening to talk to me and to talk to all of our uh, audience no problem lovely to meet you thanks